Um, so this is better in a browser. Uh, we're going to talk about advances for for gaming uh, in this really really exciting platform opportunity we have uh, running things in web. My name is Ben Craven. I'm a staff technical product manager at Unity, and I look after web platforms. I also have these two gentlemen with me, Brendan and Josh. Uh, Brendan's a staff graphics engineer at Unity, and Josh Loveridge from Stratton Studios. Uh, he's going to talk about their, their project, Prismatic, which you probably saw in the keynote. Uh, before we get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about building games for the web, uh, the rename from WebGL to Unity Web. Brendan's going to talk about his time creating our WebGPU backend. And then, like I mentioned, Josh is going to talk about adopting WebGPU at Stratton to create Project Prismatic. Uh, so first, let's dig into how building games for the web works. So building for the web is actually different than building for other platforms. And there are several stages to the process. Um, what we do first is combine your c -sharp game logic together with the managed assemblies. Uh, these first go through a stripping phase at the managed level to remove the code where sure is unused. And after that, we take the stripped assemblies, run those through the ahead of time compiler called IL2CPP, or Intermediate Logic to C++. After that, we take that C++ code and use the Inscripted toolchain to create a web assembly binary, which is kind of like the, the executable of the web, if you will. Um, all modern web browsers can run WebAssembly alongside their JavaScript, and WebAssembly runs at near native speeds. Now, due to this toolchain complexity, uh, this is why your initial builds can take a long time. We know it's not ideal, uh, and we're working on that. So continuing on how web builds are somewhat unique, uh, Unity Web doesn't have an installation step like other platforms. Now, this brings the promise of low friction and instant engagement, uh, but this does mean users need to download the runtime and starter assets on first load. So for us on the web, uh, load time is everything. It's absolutely critical that you get your load times as small as possible. Now, aside from what technically makes up a web build, like what problem are we trying to solve? Why, why is the web important? Why should you care? Well, first, there's a huge drop-off in the engagement funnel when you ask users to install something onto their device. This is true on desktop. Uh, it's especially true on mobile. Uh, if you've seen the studies, there is a, a sharp, sharp decline the moment you ask someone to install something on their phone or computer. And second, mobile marketplaces are a huge tax on creators. Uh, we think there needs to be other options and uh, sort of be able to connect to your consumers directly. And we think web is, is a great option for that. So given that users do need to download the starter assets up front, there are certainly some types of games that fit the web better than others. There are certain types of experiences that fit the web better than others. In general, smaller is going to be ideal because you get that really fast load time. So casual and hyper-casual games are obviously a really good fit. Uh, the other flow that we talk about is taking a part of a bigger game and taking one small piece of it, either your tutorial level or the first level, uh, breaking that out, creating its own separate web build, and then you have a like, near frictionless first time user experience. I think this is a really, really cool way to get people into your game, uh, experiencing the loop, experiencing the mechanics, and then once they know they like it, uh, you can convert them to the App Store or Steam or wherever else you have your, your full game. And with all that said, we're actually reintroducing a web platform with a new name. If you haven't heard, WebGL is now known as Unity Web. Why are we doing this? Uh, well, we want to separate WebGL, the technology, from our platform. And we also want to prepare for a future for, that has more than one rendering standard, um, as Brendan and Josh are going to give you a glimpse into the future with WebGPU. Uh, now, in the future, you'll be able to create a build using WebGL. Uh, one with WebGPU, or even one build uh, with both. And at the end of our talk, there will be a QR code that you can scan, and it will bring you to a page that goes over everything you need to know about uh, our refresh web platform. On top of a new name, uh, we have a bunch of other stuff 
uh, new for the web in Unity 6. Uh, first off, enhanced SIMD support improves CPU performance. Um, CM, C++ multi-threading helps you get more out of your native code. Uh, keep in mind, C-sharp multi-threading is not here yet. Uh, we know it's an important problem to solve, and, and we, are, uh, we are working through that process. But for now, uh, you can actually do native multi-threading. Um, and finally, and this is a really big one, uh, next generation WASM ups the RAM limit from two gigabytes to four, bringing us more in line with native mobile. Uh, this one is certainly the one that I've been asked about the most, uh, and it's mobile web support. So starting in Unity 6, we're officially supporting web on mobile devices. What does that mean? It means anywhere uh, WebView runs on a mobile device, you can run Unity projects. So uh, right here you can see uh, Safari on an iPhone 15 uh, with our Happy Harvest sample project. So you can run it in the browser itself, you can also run games embedded in a web view inside of a native app, or you can use our progressive web app template to make it act and behave a little bit more like a native app itself. So we know things are changing rapidly in this space, and I think a lot of us have an appetite to go direct to consumer, not have to go through mobile marketplaces, um, and that's true. But also, people have already been successful on the web. And how do they do that? Well, first off, like I mentioned, load time, absolutely critical. So you want to make sure you optimize your project specifically for the web to take advantage of that instant engagement opportunity that the web provides. Uh, and you want to put your games where users are. Um, direct consumer is awesome, but it's difficult to do that alone. Uh, and there's a ton of awesome platforms out there. Uh, there's more and more folks uh, taking interest in the web by day. Uh, and you can put your games embedded in other applications as web views on platforms like Crazy Games, like web gaming portals, or Facebook Instant. Uh, Discord Activities is another new one. Uh, a ton of awesome homes for, for you to put your games on, on using the web. Speaking of Crazy Games, you may have heard we're uh, the sponsor of the first Crazy Game Jam, as we announced earlier this morning. Uh, there will be a theme announced, and the jam starts on November 1st. It'll run for one week, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how you leverage uh, Unity 6 web features uh, in this context. So go sign up early, and you'll get dev and optimization tips, uh, as well as some deals on like extra goodies from the asset store, stuff like that. Uh, we will actually be creating a game and live streaming it, uh, so we'll be experiencing your pain alongside you and uh, in the struggle. With that, uh, I'm very happy to announce Brendan Duncan uh, and introduce Brendan Duncan, uh, our engineer who's been working on WebGPU. Brendan. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brendan. I'm an engineer for the platform graphics team here at Unity, where I lead the development of WebGL. And I'm really happy to talk about my passion project for the last couple of years, which is uh, our new graphics API, WebGPU. So what is WebGPU, and why do we want it? Uh, so WebGPU is a new modern graphics API being developed for the web as a web standard by all the browser vendors. And really what it is, it's a thin wrapper on top of native um, modern graphics APIs like Direct3D12 and Vulkan and Metal, and it provides access to features that they have that weren't and aren't available for uh, WebG WebGL. Excuse me. And so with that, we can make use of all the uh, new features inside of uh, these modern GPUs that modern GPUs provide and, uh, and make that available on the web. And there's a lot of features inside of Unity that make use of things like compute shaders, indirect rendering, that we can now provide um, in your web builds that were never possible before. And that opens up a lot of um, possibilities for expanding all the features in your site, your games, and improving performance. 
Um, WebGPU can be thought of as a successor to WebGL, but I think it's really important to note that uh, WebGPU doesn't replace WebGL. It's uh, developed in parallel to WebGL. WebGL is still an important uh, graphics API for the web and for Unity, particularly for its device reach, because it's been around for so long, and WebGPU is uh, a new API, and it's still um, maturing. And so with uh, your Unity project, you can uh, include both WebGPU and WebGL in your project. And if WebGPU isn't available on the browser, that you're running on, it, will, it can fall back to WebGL. Of course, you won't get all the features that WebGPU provides, but you can provide a graceful fallback um, when you go back to when it uses uh, WebGL. So it's a new API, and it's a lot of exciting new features, and um, it's really going to be the future of graphics for the web. All the browser vendors are very excited about it, and I'm very excited about it. So what are some of the benefits of WebGPU over WebGL? Why do we want to uh, use it? Um, one of the, I think, key features, and if WebGPU provided nothing else, this would be a reason to use it, is compute shaders. So what is a compute shader? A compute shader is a, a function that you can send to the GPU. It'll execute on the GPU. It can populate buffers and textures and it's massively paralyzed. So work that you would normally be doing on the CPU can be done on the GPU very quickly without any CPU overhead. Uh, I think a particle system is a, a great example of something that can benefit for a, a compute shader because um, you have thousands, if not millions, of points that you're calculating, doing calculations on, like its position, velocity, on all these things, and you can compute on the, your GPU millions of points and not have to do that on the CPU. And so we can open up a lot of opportunities for that. WebGPU also uh, exposes a lot of new features inside of, well, not new in Unity, but new for the web. Things like um, there's a lot of features in URP, like forward plus rendering, for example, that uh, WebGL has always struggled with because um, it can make use of compute shaders to do things like um, per object uh, light sorting. And so forward plus will let you get rid of all the limits that you would normally have for lights per object that you would have with a forward rendering. And it opens up all these possibilities for all these features inside of URP and other features inside of Unity uh, with WebGPU that WebGL would struggle with. WebG PU is also designed as a specification to be expanded in the future and for things that WebGL could never do. And one of those things uh, would be uh, multi-threaded rendering. So a lot of native graphics APIs like DirectX and Vulkan, Metal, they can do multi-threaded rendering where you split the, the rendering job across threads and you can increase performance of your rendering. WebGL can't do that, OpenGL can't do that because it's a state-based graphics API, but these new modern graphics APIs like Vulkan and Direct3D12 and Metal are designed for that, and WebGPU is based on that, so in, uh, it will in the future be able to take advantage of all these things as the specification matures, and Unity will be ready to take advantage of those as they come along. So we're really excited about WebGPU and the direction it'll go in the future. So we'll take a look at a couple um, specific examples of where WebGPU can provide immediate um, improvements over WebGL. And, and skinning, mesh skinning, is one of those things. So on WebGL, skinning is always done on the CPU. If you have uh, animated characters in your scene, that's all calculated on the CPU. But with uh, WebGPU, uh, we can use GPU skinning, put those into a compute shader, and offload all those calculations off of your CPU. And this lets you increase the complexity of your animation, animated characters, or the, the number of animated characters in your scene. So for the example, that we have this um, little demo here that we took a, the Adam character from the asset store and just put a bunch of them into scene, 30 or so of the, these characters, and just had them start marching. And, 
just compare the performance from WebGL to WebGPU. So with WebGL, we are getting about seven frames a second because it has to do all those calculations on the CPU for um, vertex positions for the animations. And uh, with no other changes to the scene, except for just switching over to WebGPU, we get 30 frames a second because it can offload all those calculations. So this lets you take all that performance that you are wasting from the CPU, put it onto the GPU, and let you do other things on the CPU. VFX graph is a really exciting new thing that you can now do on the web that you could never do before because of WebGPU. So VFX graph is a particle and effect system inside of uh, Unity that lets you do all sorts of really cool and interesting effects in your scene, um, particles, leaves blowing in the wind, all these really um, fun stuff that you can never do on the um, WebGL because VFX graph, it makes heavy use of compute shaders, and that's just not available for WebGL. So with WebGPU, we have now access to that with no change other than just using a WebGPU and putting a VFX graph in your scene. So with VFX graph, this is, uh, we have millions of um, points animated in real time and going, you know, really, it's, not even clocked to uh, VSync, so 120 frames a second, no problem. And because it's all being done on the, on the GPU, and there's no CPU involved with this except for the setup. So we, this opens up a lot of opportunities to add cool effects to your um, projects that you couldn't uh, efficiently do before. Indirect rendering is a, a little bit more of a, a technical under the hood thing, but I think it's really interesting because I'm an engineer. But uh, what it is, it uh, allows um, the drawing operations of the, CP, of the GPU to be controlled from a buffer, and this lets you um, populate that buffer from things like a compute shader. So in this example, I took a volumetric uh, data set uh, that I'm having animated over time. I generate the mesh for that from a compute shader, um, all the triangles and vertices and points, um, normals, all these things are all calculated on the compute shader. This is just using uh, marching cubes, and it controls how many um, triangles are being drawn into that indirect buffer, and then it and says draw this, and it'll draw this, and there's no CPU involved with this, so you can do in this case, procedurally generated uh, meshes, like a train or things like that. You can do control instancing and all these other things from compute pipelines. And so this will open up all these opportunities for other features inside of Unity, like uh, GPU resident drawing and things like that, that can greatly increase the, um, what you're able to draw and the efficiency of how it draws that. So you can do um, culling from a compute shader and get rid of things that are not being drawn or occluded by other objects without the CPU being involved, and you can do it very efficiently. So um, you can use it uh, from as a developer through um, our graphics API, but there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that'll make use of this as well. So um, these are the things that WebGPU is providing over WebGL, and that's why I'm really excited about WebGPU. So about WebGPU is a new graphics API, and it's still evolving and maturing. It's mostly the specification is solidified now, um, and the browsers are coming along. So about browser support, and that's a really um, important aspect of it because that's where your uh, audience reach will be. So with Windows, Chrome and Chromium-based browsers like Microsoft Edge have WebGPU enabled by default since um, several versions ago. So anybody that will open up your page on Windows with a Chrome or Edge will get WebGPU with no requirement from the user. For Android 12 Plus, um, for um, devices that have good Vulkan support generally. WebGPU is also enabled by default. And so this will allow you to run WebGPU on your Android uh, devices. There's a, a long tail of other devices like uh, 
lower end devices and lower mid range devices that don't have web GPU enabled currently. Um, Google is currently working on um, a version of uh, web GPU that will be implemented on OpenGL ES that will reach those um, devices and that's in uh, development currently. So before long, uh, um, the range of Android devices will greatly increase. So with uh, Mac OS, Chrome has WebGPU implemented on top of Metal and it's on by default. Safari is, um, has a Safari technology preview which has WebGPU enabled by default and Safari techn technology preview is a preview of what will be coming in uh, the next version of Mac OS. So Mac OS 15, uh, I expect uh, Safari to have WebGPU enabled by default. Uh, I haven't, I know 15 is out, I haven't tested it yet, so um, I can't say whether or not it's on to by default right now, but um, fingers crossed. Um, and iOS Safari has WebGPU, but it's currently behind a flag on iOS 18, and uh, that means that WebGPU will be off unless you go to the settings and um, enable WebGPU in the Safari settings. If you do that, WebGPU will be on and it's implemented um, very nicely. It runs fast and runs great, all the Unity content great. They have pretty much all the specification passing. Um, so they're doing a great job. Um, they do, Apple does not announce schedules for unreleased software, so we can't say when it'll be on by default, but their implementation is solid, and we're, we're very hopeful that it'll be uh, coming along in the iOS update soon. Linux is still an experimental, built onto the uh, um, Vulkan implementation, and uh, Firefox is still in active development, and we're ho very hopeful that they'll uh, be fully implemented before too long, because everybody is actively invested in WebGPU. So when can you use WebGPU in Unity? And you can use it now with Unity 6 in a preview state. So what it, this means is that um, currently with uh, Unity 6, you have to manually set a project setting in your um, project settings to expose WebGPU in the graphics API for the web player. That will be changing in an upcoming update where it'll just be in the graphics API list for the web player by default. Um, and we're hopeful that, or we're, I'm expecting that to be coming out um, soon. And, uh, but it's important to note that WebGPU is still a, an experimental state, which means I can't recommend it for production, whether or not you successfully do it, I think you can. But um, there's a lot of reasons why I can't, you can't say it's production ready, and the browser ecosystem is a very important part of that. We want the browsers to uh, all be on by default to make your device reach um, as big as possible. There's still some missing Unity features and bugs, you know, not my fault. <laughs> but, uh, but if you find them, let me know right away. I'll fix them. I'm, uh, I'm very excited about getting this solid. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, I can make a great sphere, but I'm expecting you guys to uh, really push in the stuff that Josh is doing, really push the envelope and uh, find all the places that we need to, to get sorted out, and we'll sort them out as fast as possible. And um, we have uh, the Unity forums discussions that um, I'm active on, and uh, as soon as you flag anything as WebGPU, I'm on it. So uh, I'm always happy to talk and, uh, and about all the possibilities for WebGPU. Um, it's something I'm very passionate and excited about. I love WebGL too, but WebGPU is my baby. So. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce Josh from Stratton Studio, who's going to share with you how he took all the stuff that I just talked about it and used it in practice with a really cool game that they've been developing. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Great to meet you all. So, um, I'm Josh. Um, been in games for a while. Um, yeah, mostly AAA game dev, but you know, now I founded the studio nearly 10 years ago now, and we build a bunch of awesome games. What games are 
have we built? Um, primarily, um, we've worked as a co-development studio over the year, mainly working on those AAA titles. Um, but more recently, we've kind of churned into an IP development house, and we're working on PJ Tour Rise, which is a mobile title that is looking to push the boundaries of what is considered a golf game on mobile, mostly focusing on the social game and experience. So we're really excited about working on that. But enough about that. Let's talk about the every, thing everyone wants to know about, which is Project Prismatic, which is our latest web GPU first-person shooter that we have been trying to develop. Um, so let's take a look. So that's Project Prismatic. Um, now, when we started out to do this, we had a mission. And you know, the mission was we wanted to create a cutting edge, direct to consumer user experience that did not compromise on visual quality or gameplay experience. We did this through four main pillars. Seamless onboarding, immersive gameplay, advanced console-like feature sets, and dynamic user interactions. Essentially, we wanted to make a game that hadn't traditionally been made in the browser, and we wanted to see if it was possible. So what we built, with this thesis in mind, we built Project Prismatic. Um, essentially, the goal was to achieve a 16 millisecond frame time, also known as 60 frames per second, on mid-level hardware. Um, we wanted to push the boundaries of what could be done in WebGPU right now today and actually you know, validate that the technology was going to be able to be used in the future. Um, we prioritize high visual fidelity at all costs. We weren't willing to compromise, and you know, we pushed everything we could to get there. Now, to achieve this, it was a process. So essentially, what we had to do was we leveraged the new um, graphics API, the web GPU side of things, and we pushed all those new cool features that were enabled by it into the game. Compute shaders, GPU skinning, VFX graph, you know, all of these core things that make a game really immersive and have a high visual fidelity we utilize. We followed a traditional AAA production pipeline, you know, to ensure rigorous optimization techniques were utilized, as well as ensuring the game ran performantly and had gameplay fluidity, following on those core gameplay, you know, mechanics that we didn't want to compromise on either, which, you know, followed through the design pillars which was really cool. Um, you can see some of the GIFs here, which are from the video. It's quite nice also. Now, to do that was, was cool and everything, but it wasn't without its problems. You know, building great games takes time, and also there's problems that you know, seep in. So the main problems that we actually came across were you know, the draw calls and on-screen topology, the download and packet sizes, which is a big thing when building games for the web, and then the memory management. So let's dive into each of them a little bit more. So when you are building a game for the browser, you need to be very careful about what you're rendering on screen. It's, you know, it's complex, and you need to keep the device performance in mind, as well as the memory limits that are in place. So we utilize map paintings for those large vistas to you know, get those real cool like, you know, cliffs in the background of the scene without actually having to render any mesh on screen. It was just a flat plane that had like a little shader on it that rotated as the player looked at it. So it kind of faked that 3D effect, as seen in films back in the day, if anyone's familiar with those techniques. We utilize LODs, um, which is base standard. And we built a cool um, node-based occlusion culling system that essentially split the game level into certain hexagonal node cluster grids. So as the player progressed through the level, they would migrate through these zones and nodes, and everything in that previous node would just get you know, occluded off screen. So we had these dynamic little sandboxes, which enabled us to be very intentional about what was rendered on screen each time. From there, we utilized um, various you know, uh, techniques like GPU skinning to essentially um, make sure that everything in the world felt alive. So all the various different you know, uh, flora and fauna that was in the jungle scene, you could see all of that was um, you know, being pushed to the GPU, which really enabled us to make the f scene feel really alive. 
Then we use uh, techniques like parallax occlusion mapping, also on the various different, you know, and um, ground textures and stuff like that to add that extra depth without having to use tessellation or anything like that. So we were able to fake a lot of that, which was really nice. Moving on to download and packet sizes, we had to compress everything. Our initial build of the title was, I think it was a 400 megabyte binary payload, which is a lot. You can't have that and be the size for a browser game. It's just never going to work. So we had to compress everything, atlas all the textures, all the usual things you would expect to do. So I'm not going to bore you with that. We utilized the addressables and um, UGS pipeline to essentially push a lot of that um, then packets to the cloud. So essentially what we could do is stream in each addressable as was needed. And um, so we could dynamically load and unload assets as required, which really helped in managing that memory and also the um, packet size that we were utilizing. Then we as well, we used asset bundles just to make sure everything was grouped together nicely. Then on the memory management side, this was um, you know, one of the more challenging ones. We utilized the job system um, to essentially you know, um, parallelize all that uh, computation that we were doing and make sure that the memory that we were, you know, the memory management side of things was handled correctly. We utilized VFX graph to essentially get everything pushed as much as possible onto the GPU. So we were just you know, freeing up the CPU on that side of things. And then as well, um, on the compute shader side of things, for various different small animations that we were doing, especially for a lot of the, um, the you know, various vegetation and stuff like that. You know, when you're building a jungle scene, it's very important the world feels alive. And we couldn't compromise on that side of things. So there are some of the problems. We overcame them, thankfully, and we were able to get pretty cool results. So frame timings, we achieved our result. We were able to get 60 frames per second or 60 millisecond frame times on average on mid-level hardware um, in Chrome on a desktop PC, which was awesome. That was kind of our bog standard that we were aiming to achieve, which we were able to get there. On the download and packet size things, this is the one, the one I'm most proud of. And um, we were able to achieve an initial payload size of just 29.75 megabytes, which was awesome. So within a couple of seconds, a user could be in the game, in the gameplay experience, and the rest was progressively downloaded as you know the user was progressing through the scene. How we got around this, you know, like every great game designer does, you give them a cutscene. <laughs> and, and so we did that. We optimized all the payloads you know, that were being progressively streamed in as the user was you know, kind of getting some of the lore about the game. And all, once all that data is initially downloaded, there's a lot of catching that gets put in there anyway. So you know, next time they play, it's going to be even better. Initial boot time. This is a vanity metric, I will say. We put you know, best server resources we had. We put it all there, and we're like, how fast can we get this? And, and we were able to achieve a 1.87 second boot time, which was awesome. That is from you know, user clicking on the link to um, Unity splash screen displaying, which is, which is really great. In more so in production, we're probably talking you know, an extra second or two there, depending on where servers are located. I'm based in LA. Our server was in El Segundo, which is like right beside each other. So it was, um, we didn't have to deal with anything there. But it, was, um, it validated our metric that a user could essentially get into the game within a couple seconds, which was really nice. This was one of the biggest things for us, because the reason we went to the web initially was we wanted to lower that barrier to entry, lower the friction that the users had. And we were able to do it, which was awesome. So, that is a brief overview of what we've been able to achieve with Project Prismatic to date. And um, we are not stopping there. We've got plenty of plans for where we're going to take this project next. And you know, the expansion of our kind of delve into web GPU has, you know, it's going to keep going on and on. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Good job, Thank you, Josh. Uh, I'm sure you all uh, agree with me. What they've done with Project Prismatic is super, super impressive. And uh, it's, we're really seeing like a sea change in what, what is possible in the browser. And things, things like Josh's project uh, really have, have the chance to reshape consumers' minds of like what we can do in browser, how powerful this technology is, um, and how quickly you can get into it. So to sort of wrap up and reiterate, uh, we at Unity are more invested than we've ever been before in the web. Um, starting with our most requested feature, mobile web support will be supported from Unity 6 onwards. Uh, and also, 
Uh, if you're inspired by what you saw here today with Josh and Stratton, uh, go experiment with WebGPU. Uh, just keep in mind that it's still experimental. So like Brendan said, we can't, we can't recommend for production, uh, but mess around with it and, and tell us what you think. Uh, so here's the QR code I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you scan this, it'll take you to our web solutions page, and you can learn all about what we've talked about today and more. Um, and speaking of WebGPU stuff, there's actually some WebGPU demos on there, uh, on that page. And if, so if you have like a, a newer Android phone, for example, um, you could load those up in Chrome and take a look uh, right now, which is awesome. So that's, that's it for us. Uh, thank you.